Welcome to Reach for the Rainbow, meeting the needs of rural and isolated LGBTQ friends and neighbors. Today's webinar will be recorded with the slides and the recording posted on MHA's website. Today's presenter is Ellen Kahn. Ellen is the Senior Director of Programs and Partnerships at the Human Rights Campaign, overseeing a portfolio of programs and projects aimed at improving the lives of LGBTQ youth and families, including Welcoming Schools, All Children, All Families, Project Thrive, Partners for Transgender Equality, HIV and Health Equity, and the HBCU program. In her 14 plus years at HRC, Ellen has shaped innovative system change work in child welfare, education, and healthcare. She is nationally recognized as an expert on LGBTQ family life, LGBTQ youth, and frequently writes and speaks on these topics for a wide variety of audiences. Um, I'm going to hand this over to Ellen, and please leave any questions you have in the comment box, and we'll be able to get to them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madeline, and welcome to all of you. I appreciate you joining us for this conversation and presentation. I want to just start by thanking Mental Health America for a really strong and meaningful partnership. We are several years into uh, partnership. Um, we've participated in activities around Minority Mental Health Month and um, kind of better addressing uh, the needs of the LGBT community and um, looking at all kinds of opportunities for that. So uh, just wanted to um, show my appreciation and uh, acknowledge that this is just yet another activity that's part of this really important partnership to us. Um, this is this is me. Since you can't really see me, I wanted you to kind of have a sense of who I was. I'm wearing that exact same shirt today um, because I thought I'd be on camera with you. And um, uh, I am, uh, I've, as Madeline said, I've been at HRC for a very long time and um, really uh, very honored to do work that helps to improve the lives of the LGBT community. Um, I always start my presentations and webinars with just a review of some of the language and terminology that I'll be using during my conversation and that is very much kind of connected to any work with the LGBT community. Um, this is just a kind of a 101. Uh, happy to provide more in-depth training down the road for folks who feel it might be helpful to them. So the acronym LGBTQ is uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. That's typically, you know, who we are referring to, the population, the communities we're referring to. Um, when we work with younger people, the Q, sometimes you'll see an, an extra Q or you'll hear um, the Q referred to as questioning. Um, and that is really specific to the sort of um, ages and stages of development of younger people where they are more likely to be exploring and questioning um, their identity versus necessarily sort of landing on a particular identity or sexual orientation. Uh, that does not mean that adults don't um, explore and question over the adult life, lifetime. Um, it's really important to remember that everyone has a sexual orientation and gender identity. If we were in the room together in a conference room, I would have started this by saying, who in here has a sexual orientation? And invariably, a couple of people would not raise their hand, usually folks who are heterosexual or straight, because we often just use the term sexual orientation and gender identity when we're referring exclusively to the LGBT community, but just a reminder, everybody has a sexual orientation and gender identity, and in doing any kind of human services work um, around mental health and general health and well-being, um, understanding one's sexual orientation and gender identity and including that in kind of a holistic look at the person and what their needs are is very important, whether they're part of the LGBT community or not. Sexual orientation is pretty simply who you're attracted to, um, who you're romantically involved with or your desires to be involved with. I say that because for younger people, they may not be uh, sexually active, but they would have awareness of uh, who they're attracted to and be able to at least express that much if they're not actually um, uh, behaviorally uh, engaged in any kind of um, sexual relationships yet. 
Uh, gender identity is um, the, your, your sense of being male or female, sometimes both or neither. Um, and uh, gender identity is very much a psychological um, part of who we are. It does not always uh, align with our assigned sex at birth. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more when we um, talk about the transgender community in particular. Um, I always mention the term cisgender uh, for folks uh, who, for whom this is a newer term. Um, if you are assigned a male at birth, you're born and the doctor says it's a boy and you grow up and identify as male and live your life as a male, you are cisgender. Um, that means, you know, you are a sec you're essentially your anatomy at birth matches your uh, psychological sense of your gender identity. If that is not who you are as you develop, then you are transgender or perhaps uh, non-binary, but somewhere um, outside of the cisgender uh, experience. And then gender expression is um, really just kind of how people perceive you when they look at you based on your hairstyle, the clothing you wear, um, the accessories, um, maybe sometimes body language. Um, and many of these things are very much on a spectrum in terms of, you know, some folks um, have a gender expression that's very like traditionally female with maybe makeup and jewelry and high heels and not that that is in any way the only way to uh, express a female identity, but that's kind of where people would, uh, you, you'd sort of say like this person is, you know, very feminine in their appearance. So on the other end of that spectrum, like someone who's very male in their gender expression might be, again, sort of stereotypical, but like jeans, flannel shirt, like short hair, maybe some boots, you know, maybe kind of stretched down the street. Um, so that's kind of what we mean by gender expression. All of these things are um, different parts of who we are. They are unique and separate parts. Uh, our gender identity, again, this is up in our brain. It is whether we feel that we are male, female, both or neither. Our sexual orientation is kind of in our hearts, um, who we are attracted to, who we have our loving relationships with. And then the sex assigned to birth, as I mentioned earlier, is literally based on your anatomy when you come out of the womb or what the pictures tell you when you're in the womb, um, you're either male or female. And that, you know, very often, based on that sex assigned at birth, there's a whole bunch of expectations that unfold for you from your parents' perspective or the perspective of others in your family that, oh, if you're assigned female at birth, you're going to grow up and you're going to marry a man and, you know, look a certain way and act a certain way. So these are things that are not always very linear for, for many people. Um, I speak a little bit about understanding non-binary gender. Some of you may be familiar with the term non-binary or gender expansive. Sometimes young people will use the term gender queer or um, uh, you know, uh, gender fluid. Um, younger people are more likely to identify as non-binary. It is really just, an, uh, a, you know, there's more language to explain how people feel inside than we had five or ten years ago. Um, and this is a quote from uh, actually someone who interned with HRC many years ago and now is a pretty noted author of a book about his own life um, as a, as a non-binary person. Um, there's a ton of stuff online to really dig into this and learn. If any of you work with uh, clients or communities and you're meeting people who are um, trans or non-binary uh, and you, you're not fully understanding their experiences, I encourage you to just read and learn. That's, that's what all of us do. So the big takeaways here just around language, as I mentioned, everybody has a sexual orientation, gender identity. I use the term SOGI as the acronym for that. You'll see it a little bit lower in the slide. So uh, SOGI is just like another um, uh, kind of uh, set of identities for people. Um, uh, your gender and your sex are not the same thing. Um, the sex is really based on that anatomical assignment at birth. Um, and we also really encourage people to think about the language you're using, to use language that doesn't sort of um, land as insensitive or kind of outdated or, or stigmatizing. Um, here are a few examples like 
we really don't use the term homosexual anymore. It's, uh, you know, is in the DSM as a psychiatric disorder. It's, you know, the language that our anti-gay opponents use to refer to us. So things like that are important to learn about and to apply in practice. A little bit about who we are and where we are and where we live. Um, we get asked so often, well, how many people are LGBTQ? Well, we can't say with absolute precision, but there is a lot of data out there um, for the sort of, you know, big picture in terms of adults in the country, roughly 4% of the population identify as LGBT. So um, that's, you know, a pretty significant number of folks, 10 million or more people living in this country. When you look at younger people, um, the CDC does a, a, a survey of high school students every other year, and in their 2017 survey, 8% um, identified as being lesbian, gay, or bisexual, or say not heterosexual, and 2% identified as being transgender or non-binary. So that's, you know, close to 10% of the population of younger people, and that does seem to be consistent with other surveys of the 18 to 24 uh, age group where um, in this next bullet, um, you know, close to 50% of younger people identify as something other than exclusively heterosexual. Um, that sort of speaks to what I was saying earlier about maybe some exploration and openness um, among younger people as they're developing and kind of um, being able to articulate their identities. In terms of where we are, and I know today we're talking about folks who are uh, in more rural areas, more isolated areas, more conservative areas, um, it might not be too surprising to see that um, some, of the, some of the states along the coasts um, have a higher percentage, 4 to 5 percent of population identifies LGBTQ, and in some of the like more rural areas or less populated states, it might be, you know, 2 to 3 percent. But what we can tell you from U.S. Census data is that LGBT folks do live in 98% uh, of the counties in the country. Um, they might actually live in 100% of those, but you know, a couple of these counties are so small that uh, it is reasonable to think that they wouldn't have folks who are out as LGBTQ. So this really tells you that no matter where you are, um, you know, working, doing, you know, doing community engagement work, um, uh, working with clients. You know, we, we literally are, are everywhere. Um, there's also, uh, oops, sorry, I went too far here. Um, so this slide shows us that um, among the LGBTQ uh, folks that are, that are in this data set, um, slightly more female than male, um, about 30% uh, raising children. Uh, what we know from some other surveys is that a lot of LGBTQ folks are raising children in the South, in Southern states. Um, which again might kind of uh, be in contrast to what our um, suspicions might be uh, about where people are living and raising children. The breakdown around race and ethnicity very much mirrors our census data of the general population, so there's really not a difference in terms of, you know, it's pretty proportionate across all, all uh, different groups of uh, race and ethnicity. And then you can see here, this kind of reflects back to what I was saying a moment ago, where among younger populations, say 18 to 24, up to 30% identify as LGBTQ, somewhere one of those identities. And then as you look toward the sort of end of this uh, bar graph where, you know, among the 65 and older population, it's more like 5 or 6%. That is, you know, not surprising. And as we go through the slide deck, we'll talk a little bit about how life is different for folks who are in their 60s, 70s, 80s versus those who are um, in their uh, young adulthood or adolescence. Um, we can also see here uh, that um, uh, LGBT folks compared to their non-LGBTQ peers are more likely to be unemployed, more likely to lack health insurance, more likely to have food insecurity, housing insecurity, and um, uh, you know, earn, earn less than their uh, counterparts. Um, this may uh, be somewhat surprising to folks because sometimes in popular culture, um, some of the folks who are kind of the more out, visible LGBT folks tend to be, you know, middle class or upper middle class, sometimes, you know, celebrities. Um, they do have, you know, some privilege and luxury to be out and to not sort of be fearful of what will happen to them if they're out. 
but the truth is that um, we are often a, an underserved uh, community when it comes to economic uh, equity and um, e uh, educational equity. I want to now shift to um, some of what we know about mental health in the LGBT community, and I'm going to try to connect this as much as possible to the kind of impact specifically on members of our community who are living in more isolated or rural or conservative parts of the country. And sometimes they are all one and the same, but not always. So just a little background. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, in 1974, after a lot of advoc advocacy and lobbying by some very brave people who were uh, willing to be out as lesbian, gay, bisexual at the time, um, homosexuality was removed from the DSM as a psychiatric illness. Uh, but it is really important to keep in mind for folks who grew up in the, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, the, the, the sort of, you know, widely held belief was that being gay was, in fact, a mental illness. And there are certainly still people who believe that and were raised with that as their belief system. And so that has a huge impact on the sort of stigma um, for especially older people. Um, who grew up with that kind of context um, in the, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and it was not unusual, uh, it still happens, but it was not unusual for, you know, decades for LGBT folks to just simply stay in the closet, to not be willing to risk um, uh, being, you know, you know, having their communities turn their backs on them. There are many, many documented cases of LGBT folks um, losing their children, losing custody of their own children because being gay or lesbian back then was viewed as being an illness and therefore incompatible with being able to be a fit parent. Um, and so, you know, it was just not worth the risk for a lot of people. And for those who, again, lived in communities that were kind of more closed, more conservative, um, it was, uh, there was really no, you couldn't imagine a, a life for yourself um, if you if you lived your truth. Um, and in surveys, uh, more recent surveys, 700,000 LGBTQ adults have said that over their lifetimes they were exposed to the harmful and completely debunked practice of conversion therapy and, of course, carry a lot of the scars and stigma um, from that experience. So that's a little bit of just what um, some of the kind of um, context is for a lot of our community members, especially those you know over 30 or 40. Um, shifting, I think many of you are familiar with the minority stress model. Um, this, this same model does apply to LGBT folks and if you're black, brown, or another person of color and also LGBTQ, the impact of minority stress is simply compounded, magnified, um, because you're, you're dealing with the kind of burden of, um, having, you know, two or more marginalized identities. Um, so we just want to remind folks that, uh, you know, certainly there are, you know, different levels of impact minority stress would have based on, you know, your economic security, whether you live in a supportive environment. But overall, given that there is still a lot of stigma and shame tied to LGBT identity, um, almost all folks in the community have some sense of this minority stress operating but absolutely some have much more than others, depending on those other life situation issues they're dealing with. Um, just a little bit of data here, um, you know, over 35% of LGBT adults have had at least um, one week, if not more, of poor mental health uh, in the past year that they were reporting in the survey. And you can see among black and brown folks, higher rates that speaks to this minority stress model we talked about. And then among uh, youth, LGBT youth, um, over 50% said they have felt sad or hopeless for extended periods of time. Um, we know that uh, at least 22%, some models say up to 40% of LGBTQ adolescents have attempted suicide in the last year. That is uh, at least four times the rate of non-LGBTQ young people. Again, really thinking about what are the drivers here that are leading to these poor outcomes. A um, little bit more data on young people. Um, you can see the correlation between um, hostile school environments, which generally speaking are more likely uh, in 
um, less populated areas, more conservative areas, um, and in states and communities where the anti-bullying policies are not progressive and inclusive. Um, so as you see, you know, you're more likely to be bullied at school um, if you're part of the LGBT community. That leads to depression, sadness, isolation, which leads to thoughts of or suicide attempts. It's also, you know, obvious that if this is what students are experiencing, that they are also probably missing a lot of school, dropping out of school, and certainly not able to focus on their academics if they're navigating um, such a challenging mental health situation. Um, our data, this is from HRC's National Survey of Youth, um, significant number of youth are not out to any health care providers. Um, they're not out to um, their, their parents or close family members. They're not out to school counselors or teachers or other uh, adults at school. Um, we do know that when young people feel like they cannot be out or they're too afraid to be out, that again is a very concrete um, factor in their mental health, carrying that secret feeling scared, feeling ashamed, feeling worried, completely distracts them from the activities of daily life that are most important for young people and leaves them feeling uh, more sad, isolated, and uh, scared. Um, Caitlin Ryan's amazing research um, is called the Family Acceptance Project. And I just pulled one slide from her presentation, which shows that um, family rejection is really a key driver. And I, although it is this science, this research is with young people in particular who are rejected by their families when they're at very vulnerable ages. Lots of adults are rejected by their family. Many adults are, were rejected by their families years ago when they came out and are still, you know, 10, 20, 30 years later estranged and carrying a lot of the pain of that and don't have as much of a support system as a result of having to have really separated themselves from their families. But with young people, you can see here, when families are highly rejecting, meaning pack your bags, get out of my house, you're not my kid anymore, those young people are you know, almost 10 times more likely to attempt suicide. If your parents or family are uh, just moderately or low rejecting, things like, I don't understand this, um, let's not tell anyone, you're still my child, but you can't ever bring a partner home. Uh, still hurtful, yes, but not as likely to lead to these high-risk behaviors. And just mentioning briefly, trans folks, transgender folks are, you know, really struggling the most. Um, almost all of the national research on the LGBT community shows us that the trans community more likely to be unemployed, more likely to be um, lacking a family support network, more likely to have to engage in high-risk behaviors just to survive, um, and much more likely to be victimized. Um, some of you may know that, um, and we HRC does a report every year. This one is uh, uh, from two years ago, but um, there's essentially a national epidemic of violence against transgender women of color in particular. Um, just in this year, we've had 11 fatalities and we're you know, not even halfway into the year. So um, uh, this is a, you know, really based on very deep bias, very deep, um, uh, misunderstanding of trans people and a complete vulnerability um, of trans folks really not having access to systems of care and support. Um, you can see here that uh, more than half of the women who have been victimized in this way have been in the South, in Southern and more conservative states. Um, just emphasizing the stigma that drives the higher rates of mental health challenges and, you know, again, tying to some of the unique factors for those who live outside of the larger cities or more progressive areas. Um, you can see here that in 20, this is a you know few years old, but uh, 2014 study found that folks who live um, in communities that have a more stigmatizing attitude, which translate to smaller towns, more conservative towns, um, we'll give some examples of those later, um, that uh, they were, you know, their lifespan essentially was affected by the the kind of hostile climate in which they're living. Um, that is, you know, something that requires urgent action, in my opinion. Um, at the state level, uh, transgender adults surveyed um, live, um, are less likely to attempt suicide if they live in states that have um, non-discrimination protections and LGBTQ affirming environments. So 
direct connection to the kind of political climate and well-being. And then we have um, just a reminder for folks like, you know, many people don't know this. There's no shame in not knowing it, but there are no federal civil rights protections on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity. So I can be, if I live in Texas and I marry my female partner on the weekend and I put a picture of us on my desk on Monday, I can literally be fired because I'm a lesbian, even if I'm doing my job beautifully. And that is true in 24 states in this country. And it is true in 26 states that uh, if you're transgender, you can be fired simply because you're transgender, nothing else about your job performance. So if you're living in those states, they do tend to be the more conservative states. Uh, you are living every day with more fear of being out, being outed, um, being maybe seen uh, with a, with a same-sex partner or seen at a certain uh, business or you know a bar or club associated with the community, maybe going even to a local pride event, um, because there are real uh, dangers in discrimination in these places. Uh, just building on that a little bit, um, when you're working in some of these communities, or really in any community that is in, you know, one of the largest cities where there's just a huge network of LGBTQ resources and supports, um, is the environment um, intolerant or hostile? I mean, what are folks seeing and hearing every day? Are the elected officials uh, using anti-LGBTQ rhetoric? Um, is the church or synagogue or mosque you go to every Sunday or Friday night or whatever the case might be, a place where you hear that you are going to hell if you're gay? Um, do you have uh, access to community centers and community organizations and activities where you can be out, where there is a sense of being welcome? Um, are local businesses the ones that refuse to bake a cake for a same-sex couple, or are the local businesses the ones that welcome everybody very clearly and proudly? So all of these things are really impacting the, the, the sense of mental health and well-being for LGBT folks. Um, this is just literally a story from two days ago. This is a lesbian a high school graduate in a small town in South Carolina who went to her high school graduation wearing, the, the, wearing pants, the, the pants that are part of the school uniform. And she was told that she could not be in the line and would not be able to walk up and get her diploma and that she would have to step away. So she went on the other side of the fence and watched while all of her peers graduated. Um, this school has a 20 year, you know, policy that boys wear pants and girls wear skirts. And, you know, this is just such a kind of conservative and rigid rule. And when she said to the administrator, but I, you know, I wear pants, like this is my high school graduation, you would fully expect that they would say, of course, absolutely, wear whatever you need to wear to feel comfortable, but it was just a big, you know, blow up. Um, so perfect example of when you are in a school or a community that has negative attitudes, and in my opinion, outdated policies, the stigma and shame is uh, amplified quite a bit. Um, so now we're going to shift to, well, what can we do about all of this, Ellen? This is just terrible. I mean, I just feel overwhelmed. Well, I hear you. And so we're going to talk a little bit about um, what you can do in your role uh, individually, uh, in professional role and within an organization, as well as just as a communi caring community member, even outside of your everyday work. Um, so I was saying earlier that you know, we really are kind of looking for uh, signs uh, to know whether we're welcome somewhere, whether it's uh, a hairdresser or a, a church or synagogue or a community program. So, you know, we might look for posters, rainbow flags, some language on a mission statement or on a, a um, you know, a website or a brochure that says, you know, if you're LGBTQ, we're welcome, you're welcome here, or we welcome everyone, including the LGBT community. So really, you know, we scan the environment to really sense whether it's a place we can step in and be safe. Um, how do you talk to and about LGBT folks in your work, in your community, in everyday interactions? Um, does your organization uh, acknowledge LGBT folks even exist in terms of like intake forms or uh, signing up to participate in a program is there language that allows folks to identify as part of the LGBT community 
or to identify as someone who like has two moms instead of like a mother father it could be parent one parent two or caregiver one caregiver two um, do we speak in ways that don't assume that we know someone's gender or sexual orientation do we if we're say talking to a teenage boy about you know his life and trying to understand what his needs might be instead of saying do you have a girlfriend we'd say are you dating one anyone is there someone special to you so just thinking about that language that really makes room for everybody to uh, to know that they're seen and heard and that it's okay to be who they are um, based on the information I shared a few minutes ago about uh, family rejection and how Family rejection at any age and stage, but most especially in adolescence when children are not able to navigate uh, and recover from that, uh, certainly with ease. Um, we, we really think about what can we do if we're working with families and family systems to help families learn about the sort of full breadth of sexual orientation and gender identity um, help children develop a healthy identity, um, to really create family spaces where um, children are not hearing negative messages um, early on that, would, that could really harm their well-being. Um, if you're growing up in a family where you hear like anti-gay language every day at the kitchen table, um, or you know, you're going to a church with your family every Sunday where you're hearing really anti-gay things, and that is who you are, and you kind of know it, um, like that's obviously not good for you so I think we want to talk to parents and other adults about how we can create those spaces where we're like planting seeds of inclusion and acceptance of all people um, working with families who are maybe stuck and in a rejecting place to help them understand how important the role is in keeping their children safe and well even if they don't understand who their children are they can still help keep them safe um, and you know when there is some risk to a child's well-being at home if, if there re really is a hostile you know potentially physically or verbally abusive home because of the child's identity um, what are some of the options or resources for helping that child uh, access a more safe place um, things you can do certainly within your professional work um, in these more rural areas in particular Sometimes it's harder to sort of find the LGBTQ folks. Um, they might be more informal networks versus like a bricks and mortar LGBT community center. But it is surprising that many, many cities and smaller towns do have an LGBTQ community center or a community based organization that is for the community. Um, so learning about where those exist, reaching out, building relationships. And where they don't exist, you know, looking for those informal networks, like finding folks that are connected, maybe on Facebook, and um, helping helping people find their community uh, in that less formal way. Um, are there welcoming and affirming congregations in different faith traditions? Are there, you know, some folks from congregations who are trying to, you know, be more welcoming and inclusive that could maybe um, help to shift some of the conversations in those faith uh, in those faith communities? Um, for folks who are very isolated, maybe even those with some kind of physical um, challenges and difficulty getting out, there's a ton of online uh, resources, very legitimate for uh, LGBT folks of all ages, um, like virtual chat groups, virtual support groups, certainly telehealth and teletherapy, and certainly crisis intervention services like the Trevor Project as just one example for LGBT youth. I know that MHA has all of these resources on their website. And then mentoring and peer support. Um, this is just like, let's say you're working with an older gay man in a rural community, doesn't really have friends or you know um, neighbors around. Is there some kind of peer support program? Someone who could check in on him, a phone buddy. Sometimes you have to be creative and kind of put those things in place where they don't exist. And then finally, um, you know, in some of these places, there really are not LGBTQ affirming or even LGBTQ competent providers. Um, someone might be motivated to get uh, help to see a therapist or go to a therapy group. Um, and there just may not be many options where this person feels like if they're out, they would be accepted or treated well. Uh, maybe word of mouth in a particular community is that, oh, that clinic down the street, they're very homophobic, don't go there. Um, 
or oh, Dr. So and so um, is part of the church that is anti LGBTQ. And again, the smaller the community, the more likely it is that you can't really find these folks. So, you know, figuring out do we have affirming providers? What, what access do we have? And can you be uh, one of those folks who helps to um, educate others, to maybe bring training in, to, to really uh, um, ask people to stretch and to be um, more willing to learn how to serve this community and even maybe sp start some special programs that serve the LGBT community in places where they're very isolated and so few resources for folks to access, especially access in person. I think too it's important to say that just you know as individuals all of us have um, you know the ability to check our own gut here just like so many of us are say as a white person I know for me and many of my white friends um, more and more uh, we are really checking our own gut around our, our racism um, what we've been taught what we've been told and challenging ourselves to do better as allies uh, to people of color and I think the same thing applies to those of us who are not LGBTQ that, um, you know, where, do, where is my bias? Where do I have, um, where do I hold on to stereotypes or assumptions? Um, where, where am I uncomfortable and why? And just, you know, recognizing that we all have these unconscious uh, beliefs and biases that are operating and can really get in the way of us being our best selves professionally. Um, I remember a training room not too long ago. It was in a fairly rural part of Missouri. Many of the people who were told to go to this training really didn't want to go. A few people came in with their Bibles, um, crossed their arms, glared at me, had just no interest in this topic whatsoever. And one of the women in the room um, at one point asked a question, which was, you know, if I believe that this young person is going to hell if he acts on his, you know, same-sex attraction, then I'm not going to affirm him because by affirming him, I'm condemning him to hell. Well, that was a really hard thing to hear. And fortunately, some of her peers were able to very effectively address her. At the very least, you leave your personal beliefs at the door when you go to work and you have to just operate on best practices. And best practices do no harm, affirm people. We've got decades of social science research on this. Um, but that is just a real thing that's operating. And we have to be aware, I'm not suggesting anybody on this call is, you know, holds an extreme view like that, but we all have some biases operating. And, and it's just up to us to keep working on that. It could come across in a very overt way, like the way I just described, or it could be a little bit more subtle, um, maybe just not making eye contact, um, maybe just using language like um, mother, father, or husband, wife, um, in ways that, you know, don't really recognize different kinds of configurations of families and relationships. So thinking about that. And then on very, like, you know, individual basis, um, a little bit more about being an ally or allyship, I remind people, it's a verb. Um, that I, yes, I am an ally, but I also do ally. Um, I, you know, interrupt anti-LGBTQ behavior. I um, educate myself and others. Um, I um, show up to stand with and, and support LGBT folks who are being treated unfairly or who need my help or support, um, whether it's coworkers, family members. Um, and so, you know, that's just a reminder that, um, you know, we, we kind of look for allyship. We, we, we recognize when folks outside of the LGBT community are truly engaged in helping us versus just sort of quote unquote tolerating us. I like to say that, you know, tolerant, being tolerant is like tolerating your Uncle Willie who comes to Thanksgiving every year and drinks too much and, you know, is annoying. Like that's tolerance. But, um, we really look for like welcoming and including like a, an embracing, really feeling like we're seen, heard and appreciated. Just a few tips here. Um, you know, as I was saying, educate yourself, be supportive, learn more about language and terminology, use inclusive language. Um, uh, you know, think about where your own kind of blind spots are as in your learning. Um, there, again, ton of resources online. 
Um, ask LGBT folks about their experience, what would be helpful to them, are, are your organizations meeting their needs, um, and just, you know, be, again, be, be an, an active, visible ally uh, to the LGBT community. Here's um, just a reminder about inclusive language, especially around gender, and I'm really working hard on one of these things myself, which is that I got used to saying guys as like a gender neutral term. I think many of us did like, hey guys, how you doing? Or come on guys. But it's actually not gender neutral. Um, and um, none of these terms up here are. So we really think about saying, come on friends, come on good people, hey folks, uh, maybe in the South, uh, y'all, y'all is a great inclusive term. So just shifting to language that recognizes not everybody identifies as, you know, a binary person, male or female. Um, and that just makes room for more folks, especially working with younger people, where we see um, more folks uh, in the younger age groups identifying as gender fluid or gender non-binary. Pronoun etiquette. Um, if I was on a Zoom call, you would see my name, and then in parentheses it would say she, her. Those are my pronouns. Um, for folks who, um, it, it's always nice to lead with your program, pronouns when you introduce yourself. Hi, my name is um, Linda Smith. My pronouns are she, her. That invites someone else to share their pronouns. Yes, people find it weird at first, awkward at first. They don't get it. But if you're trans or non-binary, especially if you're the only person in a room who's trans or non-binary, um, there's a high risk you would get misgendered or someone would use the wrong pronoun. So it's you know part of that being an ally where we're all using pronouns because we honestly, until you tell me your pronouns, I really can't know for sure. Um, this this slide speaks to a little bit of what I was saying earlier about, you know, we can just sense when someone's uncomfortable around us. Um, so, you know, make eye contact, um, try to be relaxed in your body. Um, you know, those are things that, that are like you might not be aware of, but an LGBT person in your space would would really sense like, oh, this person is so uncomfortable around me that they can't even look me in the eye. I think in terms of broader advocacy, um, I'd like to just, I just have a couple more slides here. You know, your voice does matter. Um, whether it's, you know, work you're doing uh, in your personal life as a parent, community member, you know, or in your professional role. Um, there are uh, boards of education that lead on LGBT inclusion. They can also be obstacles to LGBT inclusion. City councils, town councils, um, community advisory boards. Um, in rural and conservative areas, the more LGBTQ allies and LGBTQ folks themselves can step into these spaces and really lead on inclusion, um, the, the more those systems change. And then those folks growing up in those more rural communities, living in those more rural communities, can start to feel the effects of that change, like an inclusive safe school policy so that that young person in South Carolina could wear pants and not be shamed and humiliated on the day of her graduation. Um, so healthcare providers um, at the local hospital or the local clinic are required to have some training on LGBT inclusion so that the next time a trans person or a gay person shows up for care, they're gonna get a much better experience and really feel respected and seen. So definitely ways to change the system from inside to bring your voice to advocacy um, this is just my last point on this. Um, you know, HRC, um, as well as different state equality groups, um, almost every state has a state equality group, and HRC is a national organization, um, works with them, and we do some of our own work on essentially scoring on a scale of zero to 100 um, municipalities, including some small municipalities, uh, as well as states. And so if you're not sure, hmm, you know, you live in Arkansas, you live in Utah, you live in Florida, you live in Texas, um, take a look at where your state or your city uh, lands on HRC's state equality index or HRC, HRC's municipal equality index. Are you doing better than you thought or worse? And what could you do to be a change agent? Can you get involved with the local community? Could you... Uh, pay attention to legislation that comes along so that we can put more protections in place. Um, many states don't have a ban on conversion therapy with minors. Maybe there's some opportunity in your state or municipality to help pass such legislation. 
So um, again, the more you know about what needs to happen, where the improvements need to take place in these smaller communities, um, the more effective you can be with your time, with your knowledge, with your energy. And believe me, there is still a lot of work to do. So we will welcome anything you can bring to the table to help improve outcomes for our more rural and isolated LGBTQ community members. With that, I'll stop and see if we have questions or comments uh, from Madeline to share, and then I'll do my best to respond. Yeah, so far we haven't gotten anything in the chat box, but if you do have questions, please post them so that uh, Ellen can address them. I'll be patient. <laughs> but thank you so much, Ellen. This has been a great presentation.